The NBA Draft is truly a game of chance, where every pick made has a chance to be franchise-altering. Star players bloom unexpectedly all the time, and aren't necessarily always top picks either, so taking your team's pick for granted, no matter where it stands in the order, is just foolish. On the flip side, there are a lot of instances of teams coming one pick away from finding a diamond in the rough, but instead wind up with a dud. Staying on this topic, in this video, we'll be taking a look at each of the last five drafts, excluding last year's because it's too early to judge that class, and finding the biggest whiff of a pick in each one. By this, I mean that the team had to have picked a subpar player exactly one pick before an absolute stud, being one pick away from greatness. Before we start though, make sure to subscribe to the channel as all support is very much appreciated. Now with that being said, let's begin. To start things off, we'll go back to the 2017 NBA Draft. In this draft, there were a few selections that I was considering going with for this video, such as Jason Tatum after Lonzo Ball and Dennis Smith Jr. after Frank Nielakina, but neither of those were quite as big of whiffs as the one that I did settle on, being when the Pistons selected Luke Kennard one pick prior to Donovan Mitchell, who then got picked by the Nuggets and then traded to the Jazz shortly after that. The reasoning for why I went with this is because not only is Mitchell a far superior player, but they also both play the shooting guard position, which means that both of these players were probably on the Pistons draft boards and they went with the safer option over the prospect with more upside. At the time, Kennard was definitely a safer pick because he was coming off a sophomore campaign where he averaged 20 points per game at Duke and boasted one of the best three-point shots in the country, but his upside as an NBA prospect was always nothing more than a floor spacing role player because of his lack of athleticism, playmaking ability, and quickness. Mitchell, on the other hand, had an up and down year at Louisville, but did show flashes of star potential and ability to take over games. He had the physical tools to succeed at the next level, and he especially began to impress during his pre-draft workouts. When the season ended, he was not seen by many as a lottery pick, but he worked his way up the draft boards by killing it at those workouts. Now looking back, Mitchell is a borderline all-star, capable of giving you 20 on any given night, and Kennard has been, well, exactly what he was expected to be, a floor-spacing role player. Next up is the 2016 draft, and again, there were a few choices I could have went with, but the one I settled on was a bit of a slept on player, both now and at the time of the draft. This one came at the end of the first round, being when the Philadelphia 76ers selected Furkan Korkmaz with the 26th pick, and then at pick number 27, the Toronto Raptors got an absolute steal out of Pascal Siakam. Now, this late in the draft, teams are typically only looking for role players and rotational contributors, but every year, we see a few guys outplay those expectations and shine in the league. Korkmaz played overseas in Turkey professionally before getting drafted, and his biggest pro skill was his shooting. He also had good height for a wing player, but his skinny frame was not near NBA ready, and defensively he was a liability. Two years later in the present, he still has yet to add much weight to his body, struggles mightily on the defensive end of the floor, and even his three-point shot has been disappointing at only 33%. Siakam had a great college career, but he played at mid-major New Mexico State, so his play flew under the radar. He won his conference's Player of the Year award and flashed how versatile he could become. Now, he's one of the favorites to win the NBA's Most Improved Player award this year and has legitimately been a major reason for the success of the Raptors. He's a star in the making because of how good he is at so many different things, especially when he gets ahead of steam and attacks the rim. The Sixers have also been contenders this year, but if they were able to replace Korkmaz with Siakam, they would be even more dangerous. Now moving on to the 2015 draft, this choice was a lot more obvious. It happened very early in the draft, and it features the same team that whiffed in our previous discussion, being the Philadelphia 76ers taking Jaleel Okafor with the third pick, followed by the New York Knicks taking Kristaps Porzingis with the fourth pick. 
Okafor was a top recruit in his high school class, played very well in his lone season at Duke, and even helped them win the national championship that year. So with all of that being said, there was a reason why Okafor was selected this high, and no one at the time saw it as a bad pick. However, there were also warning signs for his future struggles. He was always labeled as an old school player because of his ability to play with his back to the basket in the post at a high level, but he also got that label because he lacked an outside jumper and struggled defending in space. Those weaknesses have held back his game in the NBA so far, struggling to find minutes over the past few years. He had a brief stretch this year where he put up some good numbers, but overall he's only been a decent backup option. Porzingis, on the other hand, was the big mystery of the draft as his skill set was intriguing but also worrisome at the same time. People didn't know if he was going to be another Andrea Bargnani or a legit star, and so far he's been the latter. He's already made an all-star game. He's incredibly tough to guard out to the perimeter because he towers over defenders at 7'3", and now playing alongside Luka Doncic will hopefully help him take his game to the next level moving forward. Again, the Sixers would definitely do things differently if they could go back and have a do-over. Moving on now to the 2014 draft, we again take a look at some of the later picks, this time going back to the second round. Now, when it comes to the second round, there's an even lower chance of getting an actual contributor, let alone a starter, but what the Denver Nuggets found was absolute gold. The Minnesota Timberwolves had the pick before them at number 40, and with it they took Glenn Robinson III. Then, with the 41st pick, the Nuggets took none other than Nikola Jokic. Also keep in mind that this was a year before they drafted Carl Towns, so they were still in need of a center. Glenn Robinson, on the other hand, has only really made an impact in the league by participating in the dunk contest. He's never been a consistent part of any rotation, gets extremely limited minutes when he does play, and has only ever averaged 6 points in a season max, and he's played on 4 teams in 5 years already. Jokic, on the other hand, has become one of the most skilled bigs in not only in the entire league, but that we've ever seen. At the time of the draft, he may have appeared to be a big, out of shape, clumsy big man, but you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Jokic has gotten better every year he's been in the league, in virtually every statistic, and the most notable part of his game is how good of a passer he is for a big man. He's averaging an incredible 7.5 assists per game this season, and the Nuggets offense legitimately runs through him. The Nuggets have been one of the best offenses in the league with Jokic on the court, and that's not by accident, and the fact that he fell as far as he did in the draft shows that not only the Timberwolves, but the entire league whiffed on him. Lastly, let's turn our attention to the 2013 draft, which was seen at the time as a weak draft class, but in reality produced quite a few good stars. The biggest star from the class is Giannis Antetokounmpo, who was whiffed on in this scenario. With the 14th pick, the Timberwolves selected Shabazz Muhammad, and then with the 15th pick, the Bucks got to take Giannis. The reasoning for this, at least at the time, was that Giannis was a huge unknown. He was the biggest project in the class by far, and while he had all the physical tools teams love from players, his skill set was still incredibly raw and nowhere near a finished product, and not every team has the patience to wait on that. Muhammad, on the other hand, was one of the top recruits coming out of high school and had a relatively good year at UCLA as a productive wing scorer. The problem was, and still is, that he didn't really do much else. In the NBA, he had a few decent seasons scoring the ball, but the fact that he never really improved any other element of his game is a large part of the reason why he's already completely out of the league. Giannis, on the other hand, is currently an MVP candidate. He's been able to get stronger every year, and that, combined with his length, has resulted in him becoming an absolute bully in the paint. Like the Sixers, the Wolves land on this list twice in a row, leaving you thinking what if they were the ones who took these players, how good they could have been. And with that being said, that's all I have for you today. Make sure to leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.